Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Are you with me? You've had time to be, right? Uh, Jesus is having the Last Supper with his disciples here. It's the Passover. Satan has entered into Judas's heart. Judas has agreed to betray Judas has agreed to betray Jesus. Jesus tells him at the table, one of you is going to betray me. And that leads to a discussion among the disciples as to as to whom it might be. And that discussion evolves into a full blown argument about which of them is greatest. What a dinner scene. And I want you to go to Luke 22, go down to verse 31 with me and let's pick up the story right here. They're still at the table. They're still at this uh, Last Supper. And Jesus speaks to Peter, but he calls him by his former name. If you remember, he had changed Peter's name from Simon, son of Jonah, to Petros, Peter, rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. But sometimes Peter was acting more like Simon than he was acting like the rock upon which Jesus could build his church. So he says in verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Aren't you glad you have Jesus interceding at the right hand of the Father? And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus has just told Peter a couple of things. Satan has asked to sift you. I've prayed for you so that when you go through what you're about to go through, your faith doesn't fail. And also you're going to come back. And when you do, strengthen your brothers because they're going to need your help. And Peter argues with the Lord in verse 33. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. I'm ready to die for you. Remember, this is on the heels of who it is that's going to betray him, turning into an argument of which of us is the greatest disciple. And Jesus says, Simon, uh, Satan wants to sift you, and I'm praying for you. And he says, no, not me, not me, surely. Verse 34, Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Now, in a Jewish day, it starts at sundown the day before and goes to sundown the next day. So when Jesus says, you're going to deny that you know me today before the rooster crows, he's talking about sometime in the nighttime or early morning hours. Now, go down to verse 54, and let's pick up the story there at verse 54. As we see what Jesus predicted or foretold coming to pass. They go to the garden. By the way, I'm skipping some of the story. They go to the garden, remember, and Jesus tells them to watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. And Peter, of course, ends up sleeping when he should be praying. And so they come to arrest Jesus. I'm at verse 54. Are you there? Then seizing him, seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and, sat, and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And it says, a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, Another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. This is the one who says, your accent gives you away, as one of the gospel accounts says. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. One gospel says he started calling down curses. And he swore he didn't know Jesus. 
And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord, who, by the way, at this point is standing there and he's probably bound as a prisoner. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the, the Lord had spoken to him that before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And everybody look at verse 62. Here's the regrets. And he went outside and wept bitterly. And I want to talk to you today about Peter's regrets. Last week, I think I talked about David's valley. Well, let's talk about Peter's regrets today. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that your anointing would rest upon me as I speak your message to your people. Open our ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church and let your word not return void. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everyone said amen. amen. You know, we've all probably had the experience where we started with the best of intentions. And, you know, where we faced a situation in which we truly meant well in that situation, only to come to a place of realization that we had done something that we truly regretted. Um, something, you know, we, we just messed up or we made a bad decision or we said something or we did something that we really wished we hadn't said and really wish we hadn't done. I mean, Peter had said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be the one to betray you. I'm I'm we're arguing over who's the greatest, and, and I'm ready to I'm ready to even die for you, Lord. And then he's over there in the firelight going, Man, I don't know this guy. And so we've we've all had that probably that experience. And when we have had regrets. And when we have regrets, we are disappointed mostly in ourselves. And we even can feel broken, really broken. I, I have before just felt broken and saddened, you know, by what we did or what we said. And, and we might begin to wonder if even the Lord is just as disappointed in me as I am. Well, that's Peter. And I want to talk to you about his regrets. I have read this story so many times. I never read this story without thinking of, and some of you've heard me tell this and forgive me, but um, some of you haven't heard me tell this. But when my sons were just little boys, about three or so, we were eating breakfast at a restaurant and one of them commented that the eggs tasted funny. And I said, well, maybe that's because they're not chicken eggs. Maybe those are rooster eggs. And my little boy looked at me and said, Daddy, roosters don't lay eggs. Chickens lay eggs. And I thought, well, how in the world does he know that? But uh, I'm, I do like chicken, even though sometimes when I go to a restaurant, I'll still ask the waitress, do you have, I don't eat much chicken. Do you have rooster meat? I, I do like rooster meat. I get all kinds of reactions from that. Some of them will look at me and roll their eyes some of them will say, I don't know, I'll have to ask in the kitchen and see if we do. But um, I was, not too long ago, I was kind of thanking God that he created chickens. Because, I mean, can you imagine living in earth where there is no Chick-fil-A? What would we do? I mean, that's just, that's just heavenly food, isn't it? Um, but I read this story and I think about what God uses in the lives of his people to get our attention and to really call us back when we've wandered off. One of the things that stands out to me is the fact that Jesus, even before Peter failed him, Jesus invited Peter back. Even while Peter is denying that he's ever going to fail Jesus, Jesus is inviting him back. One day, Peter, you're going to remember these words. In fact, it's going to be later tonight. And when you remember these words, he invites him, come back and strengthen your brothers. 
God will, the Bible says God works in mysterious ways and God uses all kinds of things in the lives of his people. And sometimes it's even animals. I mean, he, he used a fish to pay taxes. <laughs> I'm a fisherman. You think I don't look in a fish's mouth when I catch it? I've read that verse. <laughs> Bless me, Lord. Um, he used a big fish to get one of his prophets to go where he wanted him to go. And he used a donkey to speak into the life of one of his prophets. And here he's using a rooster to call a wayward servant back uh, to him. I want to I start with this story by talking about Peter trying to uh, blend in with the crowd. I noticed that the story tells us that he did two things. He followed from a distance. And when he got there, he sat down with them by the fire. He's just blending in with the crowd around this fire. And I, am, I can relate to blending in. I am by nature an introvert. People tell me that is not true. I have just learned to be more extroverted, but I like to blend in really when I am uh, in public places. In fact, I'll just tell you a funny story this week. I actually went somewhere special for dinner one evening, and I did not know that someone had told the people at this place, and it was kind of one of those uh, places where you have dinner and you watch a play, and, and, and someone had told them that, that Todd Steffi had a birthday this week. So I'm sitting here just blending in with the crowd. The lights go dim. It's like, okay, I'm going to blend in. And the MC gets up and says, says here that Todd Steffi had a special birthday this week. And I'm like, oh my goodness, how did they know that? And there were people in this restaurant that, that actually knew me and said hi to me before dinner. And I was, I was thinking, uh, and so, and then the MC says, now, it does say here how old you are. Uh, Todd, Steffi, would you like for me to tell everybody how old you are? I didn't say a word. And some guy a few tables over said, yeah. <laughs> so blending in with the crowd sometimes doesn't work. Have you ever tried to just blend in? You ever go to church and sit in the back and I'm not preaching to you folks back there in the back. You ever go to some church, maybe it's not your home church, you don't know anybody and you just try to just find a seat way back and just slide down and hope that nobody says, who's our visitor back there? Maybe, maybe some of us have tried to blend in. I'm not going to look at anybody when I say this. Maybe some of us have tried to blend in when we are someplace we shouldn't be. Maybe someplace you didn't really want to be. Maybe, maybe you're with people you didn't want to be with or you didn't fit in with. And have you ever just tried to blend in with the crowd? Because that's what Peter's doing. And it's not working very well. Sometimes God has a way of exposing you. Because he doesn't want his people just to blend in in the earth and not be noticed. He wants you to stand out as different. He wants you to stand out as a person of faith and someone who believes in Jesus. He wants your Christianity to show sometimes. Peter's from Galilee and he has this distinct dialect of a Galilean and people start to recognize him and it just gets more and more difficult to blend in. And I think part of what I get from this story is that Sometimes we might be at a place where God doesn't want us to blend in. There are some crowds that God just never intended for you or me to blend in with. You see, the calling on Peter's life was a divine calling. Jesus had changed his name from Simon to Peter, rock, and Jesus was declaring upon this rock, I will build my church and to be perfectly honest with you, church builders just don't blend in with the world very well. 
I think that's what's wrong with a lot of the church in America. I think we're starting to look a whole lot more like the world around us. We're blending in a lot. I mean, we start to look like them. We start to act like them and talk like them. And we even do the same things that the world does sometimes. And God called us not to be like them. <clears throat> he called us to stand out. He said plainly, come out from among them and be separate and I will be your God and you'll be my people. And the problem with Peter here tonight is he's trying to blend in. He's trying not to be noticed as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's trying his best to look like everybody else in the crowd and act like everybody else. He's trying not to sound Galilean. And Peter is following from a distance. There's a danger in following Christ from a distance. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but I've come to a place in my life where I just want to be so close to the Lord that I can hear his heartbeat. But some of us try to stay just far enough away that, you know, we can not have too much demanded on us as a person of faith. And Peter has never had a problem being close to Jesus until now. And if you're one of those people who sees the pastor from across the store and you feel like you need to duck down the next aisle and hide behind a product display to avoid him, maybe it's because you feel a little bit guilty about how you've been living. I don't know. <laughs> Is that too personal? I can go back to preaching instead of meddling if you want me to. If you feel you need to follow Jesus from a distance, maybe not go to church as much as I used to or, you know, just try to slip in and slip out. And, well, maybe you just need to get in church real good and just get all up close to the Lord again. Peter finally decides to stand next to them. <clears throat> he goes over and stands next to them and then it says he sat down with them by the fire and it's been said that he shouldn't have been following at all and that he shouldn't have been there at all because Jesus had told them they would scatter but here he is sitting by the fire and Peter ends up sitting there this kind of reminds me of Psalm 1 where there's this progressive downward aspect to ending up where we don't belong. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. You and I don't end up far away from the Lord sitting among the mockers in a moment. It starts with a walk from a distance. We stay back from the Lord. and Then we end up standing around with the sinners until we're finally pretty comfortable just sitting with the mockers, warming ourselves by the fire. But when a man or a woman of faith who's been called by God to a kingdom purpose tries to blend in and hope that no one notices, he or she may find it just about impossible to blend in with the crowd of the world because J Jesus, God, has a way of exposing your faith. He has a way of exposing you as one of his. And so God will sometimes put you in uncomfortable positions where you have a choice of having your faith or faltering. God will put you in situations where you'll have to be exposed as a Christian or hide who you say you are and what you say you believe. And some, like Peter, are afraid of being judged and criticized for their faith. 
And it's hard. And I believe God is calling people in these last days to stand up and stand out in this world. And I think that God has called us and set us apart not to blend in with the world, but I think he wants the world to recognize us for who and for whose we are. And the world is supposed to recognize that we are different, that we are his and that we belong to Christ. Well, how does a man like Peter, who has walked on water, who has helped Jesus feed 5,000 people, who has been used to heal the sick, and who one day is going to preach the first sermon after the birth of the church and win 3,000 souls to Christ. How does a man like Peter end up warming himself by the fire while Jesus is bound as a prisoner? And this is where we get into Peter's regrets. I want to talk to you for a minute about arguing at the table, sleeping in the garden, and fighting with the wrong sword. One theologian said Peter's denial of Christ was really the climax of a series of failures. It was not the beginning of it, it was just the climax. And if you follow the story, and I kind of prefaced some of it, but let me show you what led up to him disowning Jesus three times in one night. Talk about failures. I've had a few failures along the way. I try to spread mine out. Peter had a bunch in one night, just one after another, bless his heart, and he had the best of intentions. Trust me when I say that this night had been a long night indeed. So Satan has entered into Judas in verse 3. He had already agreed to betray Jesus. They sit at the table of the Passover meal. And as they sit at the table, Jesus is explaining to them, listen, he's talking about this cup. This cup that I'm giving you, this is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And then he takes bread and he breaks it and tells them, this is my body which is broken for you. That's some good stuff. And then he says, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Now, to be honest, this would have been a good time for those disciples to be paying attention, maybe even taking notes. I used to say to my students when I taught college, I'd say, you might want to write that down because it might be on the test later. I said that one time, you know, in church and somebody said, there's going to be a test. <laughs> but if I was a disciple of his, I would think this all sounds like something we might need to know later. He's talking about his body being broken for me and his blood being poured out for me. He's telling us he's going to die. But you know what happened? The Bible says in verse 23, they begin to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So they start having a, con a, con a, a, a conversation, a discussion about who it might be that's going to betray him. And in the very next verse, it tells us that a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. This conversation of who might betray him quickly devolves into this argument over, well, I'm better than you. Well, I've been a better disciple than you have been. Well, yeah, I'm the one Jesus loves. Well, we three were with him on the mountain of transfiguration. And we laugh at that and chuckle at that, but you know, most of us can probably think back in our church experience, we've probably seen a few Christians who had some pretty ridiculous arguments that really kind of wrapped itself around, I'm probably a better Christian than you are. Are you kidding me? 
It's the Passover meal. He's explaining the new covenant to them. He's telling them how he's about to die and that someone at the table is going to betray him. And they begin to question which of them it could be. They start arguing about which of them is considered greatest of them all. I just want to say, wow. And we can assume that all of these disciples participated in this argument. And we can assume that Peter was right up in the middle mess of this argument because Jesus as he is correcting them, he turns specifically to Peter and specifically addresses Simon Peter and says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you. But I've prayed for you, Simon. So that when that happens, when the sifting begins, your faith won't fail you. They argue at the table, and especially Peter. Jesus gets up from the table. Judas goes to betray him. Jesus and the rest of the disciples go to the garden, and he tells them very explicitly, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus goes off and prays, knowing that his hour has come, and he returns and finds Peter, and the others sleeping when they should have been praying. As Jesus is speaking, Judas shows up with a crowd of torches to arrest Jesus. And now watch this. Jesus has been telling them, you know, what's coming and what they need to do. Jesus would often use physical examples to explain spiritual truths, but they didn't get it. Jesus told him at one point, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak, buy one, because the scripture that says he, he was numbered with the transgressors is about to be fulfilled in me. And as he's talking about the fact that you need to be ready for spiritual warfare, that's what he's talking about. I'm about to be taken and crucified. But the disciples said this to him. Well, see, Lord, here are two swords. And Jesus says, that's enough. I don't think he was saying, well, that's enough swords. What are you going to do with two swords? I think he's saying that's enough of that nonsense. You're missing my point. It's not about fighting a, a physical war. It's about a spiritual war. And just as they're about to arrest Jesus, they're in the process of arresting. And the Bible tells us that one of the disciples drew a sword and cut off the right ear of the servant of the high priest with one of those swords they had. Guess who the disciple was? Peter. The one who said, I'm ready to, I'm ready to die for you. It won't be me that betrays you. And Jesus had to take the time to heal that man's ear and say, no more of this. Put your sword away. Now, this is really important. Stay with me. In John's version of this story, John tells us the names of these men. Simon Peter is the one who drew the sword and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. Hold on to the name Malchus. It's important. So we know who it was that drew the sword, and now we know who got his ear cut off. Malchus. Jesus wasn't talking about physical war or a physical sword. He's trying to tell Peter that it's time to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, because the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Peter, that's the sword you need. But Peter is arguing at the table. He's sleeping in the garden. Now he's fighting with the wrong sword. So let's move to the message of the rooster for a minute. I've often said that one of the best sermons ever preached was preached by a rooster. Which is proof that the effectiveness of preaching is not in the eloquence of the speaker, but in the anointing God puts on the preacher. 
No wonder he's following from a distance. No wonder he's standing with the sinners and sitting with the mockers and trying to blend in and not be noticed, hoping no one recognizes him. Because Jesus is counting on this man to be the rock upon which I will build my church, and he's not really living up to that name. Jesus had already set something up when he had warned Peter that you're going to deny me three times this very night. And Jesus, the prisoner, was about to demonstrate his sovereign control over a rooster. I mean, he used a fish. He's used a donkey. God can use locusts. He can use frogs. God can use anything to demonstrate his sovereignty. And the third time Peter denied that he knew Jesus, the rooster began to crow, and it says, he's, and this third time, it's interesting, this woman looks at him closely, this servant girl says, this man was with him. And in John's version, the girl said, you aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? And he said, I am not. Now, that, that's pretty easy to deny that. Hey, you were one of them, weren't you? No. Nope. Mm -mm. You aren't one of them too, are you? Mm -mm. No, no. Some lies are easy. But boy, that third one had to be difficult. Because the Bible reveals that the third time when he was recognized, it happened to be a relative of a man named Malchus. And he didn't just say, you're not one of his disciples, are you? This one looked at him and said, didn't I see you in the garden? That one had to be hard because my cousin Malchus is standing there with blood on his tunic. His ears been healed by that man, but he still has blood on his tunic. And I bet if we pull that sword out and look at it that you've got, it'll have my cousin's blood on it. Now that's a harder one to deny. I saw you. And he said, wasn't me. And the rooster crowed. And as he stood there, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. They made eye contact. And standing there bound as a prisoner, when Jesus looked at Peter, he was declaring, I am the sovereign creator of the universe. Every molecule is under my control. Every breeze blows at my command. And even every rooster crows when I tell him to. And I may be standing here bound as a prisoner, but Peter, I am the sovereign Lord of your life. And the Bible says immediately, he remembered the words of Jesus. I want to kind of bring this to a conclusion. Here's the message Peter got in that moment when he heard the rooster and Jesus looked at him. He got the message, Satan has asked to sift you. And he has to ask. I'm so thankful that Satan doesn't do anything in my life that he doesn't have to ask first. But I have prayed for you. I'm so thankful that I have an intercessor at the right hand of the Father. Do you understand Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for you and me? Thirdly, he heard an invitation to come back because Jesus, before he ever failed, Jesus said, when you come back, you never wonder too far to come back. You are never so lost that you can't come back to Jesus and to his church. And when he heard the message of the rooster and Jesus looked across the courtyard at him, remembering what Jesus told him would happen, 
The Lord stands there bound as a prisoner. He demonstrates his sovereignty and he conveys to Peter, I'm still in control. It may not look like I am, but I'm still in control of everything you're going through. I'm in control of your life, no matter how crazy and how chaotic everything may look in your life and in this world. I'm still the sovereign God of all creation. That's my Jesus. That's my Savior. And He's your Savior too. And the absolute best way to deal with your regrets is to make the one decision that you will never regret, and that's the decision to come back. Because just as surely as the Lord knew Peter would fail, he knew he would come back too. And in fact, before Peter had ever failed, before Peter ever had his regrets, Jesus invited him back. And when you turn back, I'm so thankful. I have regrets. I bet some of you do too. If you don't, if you don't, you're a baby. Keep living, you'll have some. Where you start out with the best of intentions. I'll live for you, Lord. I'll give you my life. I'll even die for you. And the next thing you know, you're saying, I don't know him. You'll have regrets. But before you ever had the failure, your Lord says, when you come back to me, I want to use you. I heard a man say just the other day that he had no regrets. And I get what he meant by that. He means I've learned not to live carrying my regrets. And I heard him say that and I thought, oh my goodness, I have a lot of regrets. But I have learned to give every one of them to the Lord because every time I have failed, I've come back. Why? Because he invited me. He invited me. And I'm so thankful that I've learned to live without carrying the burden of my regrets because of Jesus and his invitation to come back. Bow your heads with me. <clears throat> How many of you would say, Pastor, thank you. I needed to be reminded of this. I have regrets and I want to just give them to the Lord. Anybody? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lord, I thank you today that we can always come back. I thank you that even when we feel the sting of regrets of our own decisions, that we we didn't mean to make. We had the best of intentions. But Lord, you are so patient and you intercede for us at the right hand of the Father according to your word. I pray for all who've heard this message. Maybe some have been carrying the burden of regrets for years. But today I pray that you would lift that burden and let them hear your invitation when you return. And let this be the day that they make that decision to return and lay all of their regrets down at your feet and let them feel your love and your forgiveness afresh this day and help us to move forward in what you have for us. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.